Well, um, hello everyone. Welcome to my talk. <laughs> um, this is the title slide. Here's the other title slide. I've cleverly hidden my Twitter handle and GitHub account on this slide. Seems to be a running joke. Um, and yes, I'm going to be talking about uh, using Go um, to do iOS programming. So this is uh, something that's only sort of recently happened. Um, uh, the other month, Go 1.5 was released, um, which is a big step in Go history. And um, sort of alongside that, they've been working on a mobile toolkit for that. So I'm going to talk about that. Um, so here's a little bit about me. I'm Josh. I do work at Google, but I don't work on the Go team. Um, um, so I have nothing to do with uh, developing Go itself as a day-to-day -day job. I, I tend to just use Go for my job. And uh, as a result of using Go a lot, I really decided I really like it. So I figured it would be nice if I could use it for everything. And uh, sort of so did they, the Go team, that is. So a bit about Go. Um, who has used Go in the room? So nice combination of people who have and haven't. All right. So I'm going to do a few basic things um, when I get into demos, but then sort of mo mostly focus on the mobile part. Um, so all of you should be able to follow along. Um, so what is Go? Um, Go is a simple programming language. Um, Google invented it, well, certain engineers at Google invented it as a replacement for C and C++. And the way Google uses C and C++ mostly is in servers. So uh, when you connect to google.com, you're generally talking to a, a blob of C++ code uh, running on a Google somewhere, server somewhere, and it's handling a request. And they thought, well, it'd be nice if we didn't have to worry about some of these C-isms that we run into. I mean, in C++, we've got um, confusion with operator overloads and, and implicit type conversions that cause slightly awkward to read code. So they set about uh, making a language that would fix some of these, and they came up with Go. And, uh, among its features, it's got a great standard library. So you can do things like run a HTTP server um, right out of the box, yeah, dig, do thing, common things like decode JSON, uh, handle images, um, compression algorithms are implemented. Yeah, crypt crypto is re-implemented in Go, so you don't actually ever have to talk to a third-party library like OpenSSL to do TLS. Um, it's all built into Go. Um, and of course, it's uh, famous for having some concurrency primitives in the language. So Go routines and channels are central to Go programming. Um, but it would be nice if it was uh, useful for more than just server programming. And uh, this is where this talk comes in. So it would be nice if we could, say, make a, a game using Go for iOS, say, or Android. <laughs> um, and, you know. It would be also nice to make cross-platform apps that made sense. So a lot of people would use a solution like PhoneGap for this, um, or they would have some kind of transpiler. Um, the Go, Go approach is a bit better because Go compiles to the platform. It's a compiled language. And so you don't end up with as many um, performance problems or that, that sort of ilk. Um, but what you do find, um, what I'll show you later, is that um, there's, there is definitely some binding that goes on. So, um, so before we really get stuck into it, I, should, I was warned that I'd have to point this out by uh, the PR people at Google. So basically, um, the Go Mobile stuff is experimental. And what that means is they might stop working on it, which means uh, it's, it's got a bunch of implications for there. Uh, one common question people ask is, is Go going to replace Java on Android? And the answer is not going to be yes. The answer is going to be no um, at this stage. Um, the, the, the idea with Go Mobile is they're looking at um, more applications for Go. They're not looking at replacing Java. Um, Java is going to be the way, unless you're using, say, the Android NDK, in which case that's your way. Um, so yeah, um, but because this is more or less an iOS-focused conference, I figured that would be less interesting to all of you to say. Um, 
But anyway, the point still stands. It's, it's experimental. Um, changes are happening frequently. Um, the, the plus side of all this is that because it's being developed in, in the open, it's an open source project, um, someone could easily just fork it and then maintain their fork. But that's not ideal. So that's, that's, that's the downside of which I was going to start this talk. Now I'm going to talk about the, how, you, how you actually get started with this. So the two approaches to using Go in an iOS world, or yeah, I don't know, um, you could use a Go to build a framework bundle, which you then drop into Xcode and just use. And I'll demonstrate that one later. Um, or you can use Go the whole way. And the Go mobile tool will build a whole .app bundle for you, which you can then just dump on your um, mobile device or submit if you really feel lucky. <laughs> and uh, this, this second approach is limited because uh, you have, you, the interface it gives you for interacting with the mobile system is mostly sort of limited. Um, you have access to things like OpenGL for drawing and there's an audio package and there's, you can, you can use uh, bits and pieces from this Go Stand library as well. It's, it's really not too bad, but um, if you go this way, you're not, you're not really easily able to draw, like pull up UI kit and do widgets. And nor would you want to, because the ideal way for doing that is with Xcode. So again, <laughs> go back to number one for that one, which was build a Go framework for your logic and then include it in an Xcode project. So to get set up, first you need to install Go and Xcode. I assume you have that covered. You can still go 1.5. Um, that's going to be your option now. Uh, go 1.4 um, didn't really support the stuff that they wanted to do. 1.5 does. Um, and the easiest way is to go to golang.org and download the .pkg. Okay. If you really feel lucky, um, you can get uh, clone the Go repository and build it. But because Go is now mostly implemented in Go, as of version 1.5, you'll need a previously installed Go compiler to build it. Uh, and then, so the mobile components are obtained by using the go get command. Um, this is, you say go get, and then you give it the name of a package. A package in this case is either one available locally, in which case you don't need a, a host and a, a, part, a URL path. Um, or in, like this one, the golang.org uh, slash x hosts a bunch of packages that they use. So here we're getting the package mobile and everything under it. That's where the triple dots comes in um, from golag.org. So I'll start by showing you that. So here we've got a terminal. I've got go installed. Is this uh, visible to everyone? Yeah, cool. So I've got go 1.5. It's good. Um, and if I try to use go mobile, it's not installed yet. So I'm going to do something about that. So let's go dev world. Okay, now, um, Go relies on an environment variable called GoPath. So let's easily just set that up. And now I should be able to go get x mobile dot dot dot. I wasn't lying about the triple dots. <laughs> so as long as nobody's uh, leaching stuff off the Wi-Fi, I should be able to get this quite quickly. <laughs> um, it does, yeah, it, take, it will take a little, little while to get, um, but this is more or less pulling everything, kind of like a git pull. And uh, the other thing GoGet does is it will also build a bunch of packages. So while, while we're waiting for that, um, no, actually, I can keep talking. So the go command has a, another, a bunch of other subcommands that I'll, I'll probably get onto. Um, there's go run, which lets you run go in a source file, just as it is. Um, there's go build, which uses the sort of package system here. Oh, that's interesting. F16. Yeah. So I said this was experimental, right? They probably pushed something that's got a slight problem in the sprite portable package. Mm, anyway, so anyway, that's done. Um, but I still don't have go mobile as a command. Um, if we have a look what's in the directory now, it's gone and created bin, package, and source. So inside, inside bin, uh, there's a bunch of binaries there, and we've got one called go mobile. So that's what I want to add to my path. Let's go. Yeah, 
And so now I should be able to go. Oh, where? Ah, I won't find it. Won't. No, no. Okay, so I got the I got the path wrong. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Good to go. There we go. And that's the one, yeah, that's the one in the bin folder. <laughs> okay, so um, go mobile is kind of like the go command. So I'll just show you um, what go says for its help. So it's got a bunch of um, commands there, build, doc, and all sorts of other stuff. Um, and go mobile is kind of similar. It's got a bunch of subcommands there. So the ones I'm going to be focusing on are init, bind, and build. The first one you need to run when you get Go Mobile down is to Go Mobile init, and this is downloading and building more pages. Um, in this case, it's actually getting a bunch of Android NDK stuff, um, which it kind of relies on for building. But that's beside the point. For our purposes. Um, all we really need it for is so that it doesn't complain when I try to use the other commands. So anyway, while that's going, I'll go back to the slides. Um, so yes, these are the three commands I'm going to talk about. Um, the next one I'm going to talk about is Go Mobile Bind. And you pass in a target, in this case either Android or iOS, and uh, provide an output. If you specify iOS, you have to end your output with dot .framework, otherwise it will complain. Um, then you can pass in a bunch of build flags, which will pass through to the go tool chain, and uh, you give it the name of the package you're trying to build um, a binding for, a framework. So let's see how that's going. No, it's still going. Okay. When it actually generates the bindings, and I'll show you the header file when we um, actually get into it, um, the translation is more or less straightforward. So um, on the left, we have a bunch of go um, things. We've got some variables, a uh, function, a struct and interface types. And they get translated into more or less the Objective-C equivalents. So on the right, we like it's translated um, L int x, x int into int x. That's int is int. Um, string has become ns string pointer, which makes a lot of sense. Um, our function, which returns nothing, it translates into a void function. Um, you notice that it's mangled the name, it's uh, put go, and then it actually puts the name of the package that you've built there. So it'll say go package name foo, and then you can call from Objective-C or Swift code from that. Um, structs get translated into classes, um, so that's really nice. Um, you don't have to try and, try and use a C struct. Um, you'll be able to use an Objective-C struct or from Swift some sort of equivalent, and uh, interfaces become protocols because that's, again, essentially what they are. So go mobile and it's done. Right, so let's go into source, and I'll make a, just make a new uh, demo package, and there's nothing in there, so um, let's start, let's open up a text editor. Find the where's Dev World? Hmm. That's weird. Ah, oh, yeah, home. <laughs> there we are. Okay, Dev World and Source. So let's make a new thing in the demo folder. If we oh, let's switch that over to Go. Okay. Uh, every Go source file has a package it's in. In this case, um, I'm calling it package main, but it's actually in the demo package. This means I can go build and it will produce a binary rather than a, a library. Small, small details. And I can go func main, oops. And the standard hello world goes ferment.println hello world. So I should be able to go run, oops, saves as untitled.txt. Let's rename it. 
rename called main.go. Okay, yeah. now we can go run main.go. Ah, I haven't imported the FMT package. How do we fix this? Well, there's a separate um, command line tool you can get. Um, Google search for it, you'll find it, called Go Imports. And it will have fixed up the imports. So there it's detected that I used FMT and now it's imported it. So I should be able to go. Yeah, there we are. It works. Now, um, we want to be able to use this from, say, an iOS app. So now it's time to start finding a, a library. So obviously, printing to the console isn't very interesting from an app perspective because your users won't be able to see that. So I'll go back to here. And instead of having a main.go, I'm going to make a new file called demo.go. Demo.go. Put this in the demo package, and I'm going to have a func called doge. It's going to take strings s and t and return another string. And what this uh, function to do is I'm going to return sprintf. You can see that they're very C-like in some respects. So print lens, sprintf, that sort of thing. Um, and it takes a format string that looks a lot like C format strings as well. So we're going to have very percent %s, such percent %s, wow, and pass in s and t. Now, again, um, I could run go imports on this to fix up the packages, but I'm just going to go import. If we have more than one um, import that we want to make, we can put them all in brackets like so. So if I say, say I was going to import some other package, um, say I wanted crypto or something in there, you could uh, put them in brackets <coughs> like that. And this also applies to other things that you might have in your file. Maybe you have a var block, like x equals 42. There, we've just declared a um, integer variable called x. It's at the package level, and we've assigned it the initial value of 42. If we just um, created a variable of type int, it starts with the default zero value. There is no such thing as uninitialized memory in Goland. It's all initialized. If you don't specify what it is, it's going to be the zero value, which is for ints, that's zero. For pointers, it's nil. Um, pointers and interface types, it's nil. That sort of thing. But anyway, we don't need any of this. Um, we're just going to have that for starters. So back over here, I'm going to cd up out of that. When you refer to packages, um, they're, for most Go commands, they're relative to the Go path. So Go path is um, currently where I'm sitting in the dev world folder. We can check that by going Go path. Yep. And um, they're, reference, they're relative to the source folder inside the Go path folder. So, here, if I go build um, demo, um, okay, so it's complained because there's two different um, packages in that one package, which can move the um, main file out of that. Uh, just move it into here. Okay, so now we build the demo package, it built, and we have a look in here. Um, there's nothing, so what's, what's in the bin folder now? Um, well, it hasn't appeared there either. But if we go mobile bind target OS, o bin, oops, flag o bin demo.framework. It takes a bit longer because it's linking a bunch, a whole bunch more frameworks in automatically for you and also doing some binding translation for you. So. Now let's go back into bin and have a look what it produced. So we see now there's a demo.framework down the bottom here. And if we have a look inside demo.framework, oh look, it's a framework bundle. Let's have a look inside um, headers. There's a demo.h. And now we have what, uh, what, object what uh, Objective-C generated. So it generated a function which takes two NSS strings, pointers, and returns an NS string. And it's tagged it with foundation export so that, um, you know, whatever that provides. <laughs> doesn't really matter. <laughs> 
So how about we use it? Okay, so here's Xcode. Well, that's not really Xcode. Here's Xcode. Actually, that's not really what I wanted to do. I'm gonna go a new project. Let's make an iOS app. Let's make a single view application. We'll call it Foo. And I'm gonna use Swift because that's all modern. That's the way the kids do it these days. Um, yep, so just dump it in the code folder, that's fine. All right, so let's start with setting up something that will actually use this um, label, sorry, this, uh, this function. Uh, we want to present it to the user, so let's dump on a label. Label. And I'm not going to use any of the knowledge that I learned from Seb Beswick's talk about constraints. I'm just going to set this to be a multi-line label, by right? lines equal zero. Now I need um, some way of controlling that label. So over my view controller, I go IV outlet, weak var, label, colon, UI label, bang. Oh, keep wanting to double click on things. And connect the two. So now the view controller is connected to the label. Now all I need to do is um, dump the framework on and start using it. So I go into Finder. Here we go, that's my code folder. Here's my dev world folder. Let's dump that demo.framework on. We'll copy it in just for laziness. I should be able to go into view controller and use import demo. Oh no, that doesn't work. It says there's no such module demo. So part of this being experimental is they've got Objective-C bindings, but they don't quite have the Swift story there yet. Fortunately, this is very easy to fix. The way modules um, around Objective-C frameworks work is there's an extra module map that just gets added to the framework bundle. And because I figured this out earlier today, I can actually fix up my demo framework um, using a script that I made. So <laughs> I'm going to go run... Um, modulizer. Uh, I'm going to pass in the name of the demo framework, the name of the module that I want to create, and the name of the header file that is going to wrap. It goes and does it. So if we um, want to have a quick look at what that's, that, that's done, which, you know, we'll have a look at the demo framework. We see there's now a modules directory in there, and inside um, demo framework modules, there is a thing called module.modulemap, and that's, that's all it is, right? Once you have that, you're good for Swift. Um, unfortunately, I copied the framework in rather than, so I'm just going to delete that, move it to trash, and then copy it back on. Do, 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 do. Oh, keep double clicking on stuff. And we notice that the error's gone away. So, just to show this off, um, yes, we see it builds and it runs, but I haven't actually done anything with a label, so we'll just see the label showing label when it loads. If it loads. Oh dear. Oh, that's quite large. Oh yeah, oh, thank you. <laughs> there, label, okay, so that built and it worked, but it didn't do anything interesting. So after uh, view did load, we'll go label.text equals go demo doge, and it's protected to the strings, which were defined as NS string pointers in the actual header. So this is all working really well so far. So we're gonna go iOS for the first one and go for the second one. Now let's try it. Now we should see something on that label. I probably shouldn't have quit the simulator. <laughs> okay, there's, there's a simulator, launches the app. Um, it's probably just running really slow. Yeah, oh, there we go. <laughs> so the string formatting was done in, in GoLand. <laughs> it's already a pretty vacuous example, but um, 
it does demonstrate that you can do the majority of your logic in Go and then just call functions and classes and stuff from Objective-C or Swift, which is lovely. Um, one thing that I found about um, some of the binding stuff is that in Go you have functions that return multiple values. This is a common pattern is to return um, the value that you want to return as well as um, an error. Error is just a, an interface um, type and it will accept anything that um, has an error um, method on it. But obviously in Objective-C, say, you can't return multiple values unless you pass them in as pointers in your parameters to the function. So that's actually how um, the binding gets created. Um, if I have a function called example here, and it returns a string and an error, the string and the error return become out pointer arguments on the, on the binding. Um, so that was the demo that I showed you. There's already an app on the App Store that you can download that uses frameworks built via Go. It's called Ivy. Well, actually, Ivy is the name of a programming language created by one of the Go authors, and it's inspired by APL. And um, they got to the point in developing it where they had 5,000 lines of Go that implemented this language, and they're like, great. Um, I don't really want to port it to Objective-C or Swift to run it on iOS, and I don't really want to port it to Java to run it on Android. So go mobile to the rescue. It um, now lets you get, you can download this from the App Store today, and it will, this is a working example of this whole thing. So now I'm going to talk about the um, stuff, the other stuff that you can do um, with Go Mobile, because it's not just a binding library for mobile f um, development. It also provides a bunch of frameworks that might be useful to your app. And uh, one of the things is um, there's, I also mentioned that it uh, provides OpenGL bindings, but it'd um, be nice if there was something a little higher level than op just OpenGL bindings. And there's a sprite library that also comes with Go Mobile. So um, it's more or less arranged into sort of four main parts. There's a kind of a sprite engine. Um, nodes, which um, are corresponding to things that you're displaying on screen. Texture and subtech. Um, texture is literally just like an image that you load into the graphics unit of your mobile device. And subtech sort of refers to one of those and provides texture coordinates. And arranger, which is just a way of positioning, like rearranging them on screen as time proceeds. So uh, an engine is aware of a bunch of nodes um, that it has to display, and the nodes form a tree. So basically, your top level node might be a scene with some books and a fire, and a couple of gophers that are running between the books and the fire. Um, one of the examples that the Go Mobile pr um, framework provides is actually a little a cute animation with gophers tracking books back and forth. So I might as well show you that. We can go, let's go up. OK. So you notice um, if I look into source, um, not only do I have my demo package there, but it's also got golang.org. And actually, that's, um, that's where the Go Mobile source is actually living. So if we want to build and use it, what we can do is we can go, uh, we can, I'll just show you because um, this is fine. We can go build. Sprite. And the packages go lang dog x mobile x right. no. What was the example? I think it's that. <laughs> we'll find out. Yeah, okay, so it builds. Okay, and so over in bin sprite. Oh, sorry. We have a sprite um, binary in there. So I said this was the Go Mobile framework talk, but what it actually does, um, if you just use the plain Go commands, it will um, build and link it for the actual pro platform you're on. In this case, this would be my laptop. So if I just go and run it, it, oh, it didn't work. Oh, it doesn't know where the assets are. I'm going to copy in the assets. Ah, that's the 
directory, of course. All right, so I have the gophers in there. I'm going to make a um, assets folder. Yeah, there we are. That's not a very big demo. Uh, yeah. So that's what you'd see on your uh, mobile device if you, well, obviously it would be sized to the screen rather than this tiny window. Um, and to actually demonstrate that it does work on mobile as well, what I'm going to do is kill that. I'm going to go mobile, build. So this is similar to the bind command, but you just replace bind with build. Target iOS, o sprite.app, and then I'm going to pass in the source. So, golang.org, x, mobile, examples, sprite. And obviously, again, this takes a little longer because it's linking against various other frameworks and libraries that it's got to do. <sighs> this is, well, I'm pretty, pretty sleepy today. <laughs> All right, that's done. And see, we've got sprite.app in there. Um, actually, building an app um, won't work unless you've got S code and you've got your mobile provisioning stuff it's already set up because it uses those. To actually get it on my device, though, so here I've got an iPhone. There's an iPhone. I'm going to use the, this is the devices window from Xcode. So I'm going to pick my iPhone there and from Finder, I can just go sprite to that. There it is. Dump. And now it's on the device, so I can just run it. There we go. Uh, it's not very interesting. Uh, it does handle um, rotation as well. So yeah, now it's going that way. Down the bottom left, there's a FPS counter. So I'll just show you some of the um, code in that. If we go up, source, golang, x, mobile, example, sprite. Here's most of the program. So obviously, here's, it, it's referred to a bunch of the Golang mobile packages there. Um, and it sets up an engine, a Sprite engine. Here it's using the GL Sprite implementation of the engine. There's a portable implementation as well. And it has a reference to uh, its top level node, so it can keep rendering that one. Um, because it's cross-platform and works on Android and iOS, it doesn't give you a bunch of um, event things you have to hook up. Instead, it it gives you the opportunity to poll for events, and each event you dispatch yourself. It's a bit, a bit of an easier cross-platform way of doing it. So here it gets two different kinds of events from a.events. a.events here is, um, it returns a channel on which events are passed. So we can just range over it. And then inside we're switching on the type of the event. So this is what this, um, this uh, dot bracket type syntax is about. It's uh, matching on type of um, app.filter e. And uh, then ass assigning the typed result to this variable called e. So if we get a size.event, we're going to save that in a variable called sz. And if it's a paint event, we're going to call our paint method below and then call end paint on the app. That's pretty simple. And it's a fairly common pattern you'll see in you know, Go mobile apps for now. And the painting is quite simple. It does geo clear color, and then geo clear. That's open, <laughs> fairly sound open geo stuff. Um, it computes a time uh, quantized to 60 frames per second, and then tells the engine to render. And then there's a debug package that will draw the frame per second counter down the bottom. It just needs the size. It doesn't need to know anything else about like what time you're at. And the rest is uh, more or less just setting up that scene. So 
I said there was a top-level scene, and underneath that there was a couple of sprites underneath it. So we've got um, textures that it loads. It sets up a new scene and uh, registers it with the engine. It sets up transforms. These transforms are just um, affine matrices. Uh, really simple. We have like X scale, Y scale, and uh, X and Y position here. And it does that for the books, the fire, and then it has this arranger function which it uses to move the gopher back and forth. It also changes the gopher from facing right and facing left, depending on where it is in the animation. And then it's just got a bunch of stuff um, for loading the textures. Now, it's actually only loading one texture and then having four different sub-textures refer to regions in that texture. As you can see, that's just as simple as creating new instances of this sub-tech um, struct, passing in a reference to the texture that it loaded, and then using the image rectangle to specify sub-regions. And that's basically it. The rest is just glue code for um, making the, the types match up. Now, um, I wanted to do something more than just show off demos that you can download yourself. So I went and made a game. Or I'm in the process of making a game. Which looks a lot, quite a lot simple, um, similar to what I just showed you. So it's got um, sub-textures and um, textures and game engines and rendering and all sorts of other stuff. And the game is called Room Service Quesadilla. <laughs> and uh, basically, the it's kind of like Cannibalt. Um, your, base your hero character is basically running through a hotel trying to deliver a quesadilla. And um, it keeps tripping over cactuses. And the goal of the game is to see how far you get rather than actually deliver the thing. So I set up a little script for setting up the go path and everything. So I don't have to remember where I am. Now I can go run. When you um, go run, it's not interpreting the code. It is building to a temporary directory. So that's why there is a delay here. But once that's done, ta-da. So it stopped because he hit a cactus. So um, similar to the size and paint events, it's also dispatching touch events. Um, obviously, because this isn't a mobile device, um, it's translating mouse clicks into touches. But again, if I ran it on my phone, it would be touch events. Uh, and so now that's basically the whole of my talk. i um, going to whip through the rest of the slides. Um, that was the go build command. Um, I mentioned there were two. Um, uh, rendering engines for Sprite, um, and it basically, the only thing to remember about um, scenes and node trees is that it does go depth first, right? So it'll, it'll go depth first, and it'll go from first child to last child in the order you append them, more or less. Um, thanks, that's my talk. Do you have any questions? What does modularization actually mean? Because I I want to add it to the uh, Go Mobile stuff so that it does it for you. Um, but I'll show you the source code really quickly. Um, if I go open code junk modulizer. So this is a really um, simple example of the text template package in Go. So here I define a template which contains the text framework module and then some tags that it substitutes with um, the flags that I pass in. Here's an example of flags. So it doesn't have the value of the flag before it, when it compiles the app, but it does when you run it and call flag.parse. So these variables are pointers to strings. And then, so which, which is why you have pointer to header, pointer to module down here, that sort of thing. And the rest is more or less this basic um, OS package stuff. OS.create for creating a file. Um, um, here we execute the template, passing in. This is an anonymous struct type. So here I've got a structure which contains two strings, and I haven't given it a, a name, but I have um, provided uh, an instance of it. And uh, then I have OS symlink. So that sets up the modules directory, which is supposed to be a symlink to versions A, current, or you know, frameworks. <laughs> Any other questions?
Yes. You mentioned that Go is a compiled, compiled language, so I assume that the framework that you created for export version is like an assembly language in assembly. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's a, so the, the framework that um, it builds um, is like a, it's, it's a fat binary effectively. It works in both the simulator and on the device as, but it's, it's compiled as like a .a file inside it or whatever. I, I'm not actually sure what it compiles to these days. But yeah, um, the, compiler, the compiler can do cross compiles and it, um, so while the default Go compiler will build uh, Darwin AMD64 code, um, when I run it with the Go command, with the Go mobile command, it knows, oh yes, I need to build for mobile, so it can build Dumb on AMD64 instead. So have you tried to into the comparison of performance between the Go framework and like, like recent native implementation? Yeah, so the big differences will probably be around memory management. Go is a garbage collected language, um, whereas in Objective-C you have ARC and retain release, that sort of thing. Um, I don't know what they're doing with Swift. I'm just not up with what the modern kids are doing. Yeah. Uh, I don't see there being a huge uh, performance penalty to using Go. All right, I think that's it. Thanks for having me.